Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. Uh, if you have a Bible or Bible device, you're going to want to go ahead and grab that. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 1. And that's the only place we're going to be. And let me kind of fill you in uh, on what we talked about last time. Of course, you can go back and watch the introduction video. I encourage you to do that to get all the details. But last time we did not go through all of chapter one. We just went through the first two verses and provided an introduction for the book of Genesis and, and provided a biblical foundation for God uh, creating intelligently everything uh, in the universe, including ourselves. And we've been created in the image of God. We are ultimately held accountable to him. These are the things that, that uh, we discussed. And uh, this week, we are going to finish chapter 1. We are going to look at verses 3 to 31. And next week, we're going to have a special guest uh, who is a medical student who's going to be able to talk about the, the scientific, biological, and chemistry elements of, of the fact that we have been created uh, in the image of God. So uh, next week, again, I'm not sure how we will end up filming next week. If there is not a video next week, uh, I apologize, but we, we will see what we can do. Um, but we are going to get into God creating all these things. I am handling it from a theological uh, and historical point of view. I'm not a scientist, so uh, I, I'm, I am not the type of person to get into a scientific debate over anything. Uh, we will look at some very little elements of science that I know here in just a little bit, but they're just some fun facts. That I can't get into detail on them. Uh, but we're going to look at God creating everything, including us. We're going to have a somewhat awkward conversation here uh, at the end, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. But we will finish chapter one, and um, that'll lay a solid foundation for our special guest next week. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll begin starting in verse three here in Genesis 1. God, we know you're there, and we are so thankful uh, for your grace uh, that you have created us, Lord, that you saw your plan for creation and knew that this moment in time needed one of us, and that's we're just so flattered, Lord, uh, and, and so thankful for your grace, thankful to be created in your image, and I pray that you continue to use this group to deepen our knowledge of your word, deepen our knowledge of you, and, and in doing so, I pray that uh, our faith grows as well. Use this time to Christ's name, amen. So let's begin. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. <clears throat> and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. So not only has God literally created light and separated light from darkness, well, that is actually a huge theme of the entire Bible, both literally in this instance and metaphorically as we go later on. Um, a large theme of the Bible is God allowing his light to penetrate the darkness. Right, we see that when Christ comes and, and him bringing light to the world and, and defeating the powers of darkness. So the, the light coming into the darkness and breaking up the darkness is a huge biblical theme. Here, though, it's literal. And when God says, let there be, it simply then is. God's command, right, ends in an assurance that it has been created, right? So he says it and it's created. In this instance, he says, let there be light and pow, there was light. And he separates light from darkness. Notice he's also naming all these things. He, light and uh, day and night and sea and land and, and trees and all these things. He's giving them names. That shows us God's sovereignty, right? God is in complete and total authority. And because he is, he uh, is able to name all of these things. In the ancient Near East, and by the way, that's where Israel is. It's in the Near East naming things was seen to be as an act of lordship, okay? So you didn't just call something something random. You had authority to name things. So because God has authority to name everything in existence because he's created it, shows his ultimate lordship and authority. Uh, so here, now we have light created. On the first day, uh, light and darkness are separated from each other, right? Let's look down here at verse 6. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. Now, if you are using maybe the King James, or the New King James Version of Scripture, it may not say vault. It may use the word firmament. Firmament just means heavens, right? So when we talk about uh, the heavens, if yours uses firmament, literally the word firmament means something that's hammered out and stretched out, right? So stretching out of the heavens. So he says here, let there be a vault right between the water and the heavens, right? He's separating the waters from the sky. 
uh, verse 7. So God made the vault and separated water from under the vault from water above it, and it was so. God called the vault sky, or what we would call the heavens, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. Now notice the, the detail here. It gets a little bit confusing here in verse 7. God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. That, that can get lost on us a little bit because when we talk about the vault being sky and the separation between sky and water on land, how can there, what, what kind of water are we talking about in the sky? The, the best way I've heard this interpreted, God has separated the bodies of water on land from the molecule-like water in the atmosphere, right? So there is water, there is moisture in the clouds of the sky. God has separated that from the, uh, the, the bodies of water like oceans and seas and rivers here on land. Verse 9. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and he gathered the waters and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. You're going to see that phrase, and it was good, come up several times right, uh, throughout this. And we'll talk more about that after we hit the last one here in just a little bit. But everything that God has created, he is calling good because everything he's creating is good, right? So you're gonna see uh, that phrase, and the Lord said it was good, and it was good come up in many different places as we continue on here. But now we've got land. So he has created the land and he has separated the land from the waters. And once again, you can see his sovereignty because he is able to call these things by their names, right? Verse 11, then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seeds in it, according to their various kinds. You'll notice that when these categories are given, plants, seed bearing plants, fruit, fruit trees, all these things, you'll notice that those are pretty broad categories. The, the, the author of Genesis is not getting very specific with the kinds of trees he's creating. And the reason is, those are broad categories, seed-bearing plants, trees, fruit trees. There are so many other categories that, that can be underneath the, those, those categories. And so the reason that these categories are so broad is because the author of Genesis wants us to know that God has created every single kind of tree, every kind of seed-bearing plant he created, every kind of tree he created, every kind of fruit-bearing tree he created. And you'll notice here it says, it gives us the detail that they are seed-bearing plants, meaning that these plants are going to be able to reproduce. Remember, when 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 uh, the seeds get heavy, they fall out of the plant, and then that creates a new plant, and then those seeds get heavy, and they fall out of the plant, and it creates new plants. So these plants, God has created them with the ability to reproduce themselves. That's why we also get according to their various kinds. Different kinds of plants give different kinds of seeds, and they reproduce a little bit differently. And so according to the kind of plant it is, God has specifically designed it to reproduce itself, right? Which is absolutely fascinating. Look at all the various trees and bushes and fruit trees, all these different things. Um, look at how many exist now, right, from, the, from even the point of creation. So God created them with the ability to produce and multiply. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, verse 12, the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds and seeds bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the third day. Verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate day from night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. Sacred times and days and years. In ancient times, people could look at the weather, right? They could look at where the sun, where the moon, where the stars are placed in the sky and know what time of year it was going to be. And so God has allowed people to know that because he's placed those elements in the sky to be able to tell them those things. Um, let's see here, verse 15. Uh, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky. Once again, that word vault could be firmament. We're talking about the heavens here. Uh, let's see, I'll read verse 15 again. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light to the earth. And it was so. Remember, God commands it, and it happens. Command results in, in, in action here. God made two great lights, 
the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. Now, obviously, he's talking about the sun and the moon, the sun being the greater light, the moon being the lesser light. Well, is he being disrespectful to the moon? I mean, calling it lesser? I mean, the moon's pretty incredible. Not at all. Remember that the moon doesn't give off its own light. It's a giant mirror. It reflects light. So the sun gives off its own light. So the sun is the greater light because it gives off light. The moon is the lesser light because all it is doing is reflecting the uh, light that's given off from the sun. That's why it's called greater and lesser light. Also, the sun is bigger, to be fair. Uh, we're still there in verse 16. He also made the stars, right? The stars are absolutely incredible. It's amazing that he's created the stars because many ancient Near Eastern religions, they worshiped the stars, right? Many people uh, made deities, right? Or, or gods out of stars. And many groups like the Babylonians were very astrological. They, they would look at the stars and look at the signs and things of that nature. They would worship the stars, but God created the stars, right? Which should show you his incredible power, right? Many different nations worship the stars, but our God, he is the creator of the sun and the moon and the stars. It's absolutely incredible. Look at verse 17. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. So last week, just a side note and take a break here, we talked about how Everything in creation is too complex to be a random result, right? We talked about Mount Rushmore. When you look up at the faces on Mount Rushmore, you should not ask someone, did somebody carve those or is that the result of millions of years of weathering? I mean, they would look at you like you're crazy, we said, and because you instinctively know the difference between intelligent design and random result and the faces of Mount Rushmore are far too complex to be a random result. Um... But we ask the question, what about a newborn baby? What's more complex? Faces carved in stone or the face of a newborn child with uh, eyes that see and ears that hear and lungs that breathe and a mouth that tastes and speaks? The human body and these different elements of creation that we've discussed here and that we will discuss are far too complex to have been random result. Billions of years of evolution creating a random result and the sun and moon are no different. They are far too complex to have just been created by a Big Bang. All right, so let me, let me give you some, some facts here, right, about the sun and the moon. I mean, to show you that these are far too complex to be random. First of all, let's talk about the sun. It is 93 million miles away from the earth and can still burn you. Think about that for a second. You can get sunburned. I get sunburned all the time because I, I have horrible pasty skin, right? Anytime I'm outside for even a little bit, even if I wear sunscreen, I get burned. That object that causes the burn is 93 million miles away. That's how powerful it is. It is so powerful that in order to replicate the sun's power here on earth, we would have to detonate 100 billion tons of dynamite a second in order to replicate the sun's power. Far too complex to be random. It's 109 times larger than the Earth, right? And then let's talk about the moon. The gravity of the moon is what creates ocean tides, right? The push and pull of ocean tides. Um, the moon, as I said earlier, it's a giant mirror. It reflects the sun's light, right? When the sun is on, as the Earth rotates, the sun is on the other part of the world. It is still reflecting, right, the moon's light, or it's still reflecting its light off of the moon. And it orbits the earth once every 27 days, exactly, continually moving around. As far as the stars go, the stars serve as lights uh, when the moon is not out, right? You can still see some of the stars. And uh, that, to me, there's nothing more beautiful than to go out and just look up at, at a beautiful night sky. And scientists tell us that there are estimated, just in the Milky Way galaxy alone, which is where we live, 100 billion stars. And some of them die and fall to earth, but they're replaced by new stars. Far too complex to just be random. God allows those stars to die, and he allows new ones to be created. He allows the earth to rotate around the sun. He allows the moon to rotate around the earth specifically once every 27 days. The earth rotates specifically uh, you know, one time every 24 hours, but then 
around the sun every 365 days. And, and all of that is completely divine design. And I think we consistently need to remind ourselves of that. But here he has created the sun and the moon and the moon to govern the night and the sun to govern the day. Look at verse 20. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures. And now we're creating uh, sea animals and, and land animals. Let the water teem with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing in which the water, uh, with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds, meaning that both the birds of the air and the creatures of the sea are going to be able to reproduce, right, themselves. And every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Now catch this in verse 22. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. God blessed them. That is an incredibly important uh, statement that you see all throughout scripture. The blessing of God is a beautiful, beautiful thing. That is the first time in the whole Bible the phrase, God bless them is used. And it's used about birds and fish. Think about that for a second. A lot of times, you know, we don't we assume that God thinks of the animals and the birds as less, but, but he doesn't. Matter of fact, they are the first thing that receives his blessing, right? I think that's absolutely incredible. The first time God says, and I bless you, I, I give you my blessing, he, he's talking to birds and fish. I think that's incredible. Verse 23, and there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. Remember, there are six days of creation. 24, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. So remember, like with the trees, those are three pretty broad categories. The uh, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals. Those are three broad categories. And once again, the big idea is that God has created everything in existence from the plant, the seed-bearing plants, trees, fruit-bearing trees, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, wild animals. God has created everything in existence, right? That's the point we're trying to get here. So it's not that, the, that Moses here, the writer of Genesis, is wanting to not be specific it's he want he's giving broad categories so that we understand that he's created all things right that's why he gives broad categories let's see here um verse 25 god made the wild animals according to their kinds the livestock according to their kinds and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds meaning they reproduce and god saw that it was good then god said here we go here's the big one 26 let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So let's talk about that. God is now going to create humanity. But notice that the, the words listed here are plural. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. What are we talking about? Remember last week we said that we serve one God made up of three persons right? One God made up of three persons. And so um, we don't serve three gods. One God, three persons. I keep repeating myself so that you understand it's not three gods. It's one God. And so we've got God the Father. Right? He's the one that's active here. God the Son, that's Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. All of those uh, persons of God are together in the beginning. We talked about that last week. If you look back to Genesis chapter 2, or Genesis Chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And it says, in the beginning, God created. There's God the Father. He's there in the beginning. At the end of verse 2, it says, the Spirit of God was there in the beginning. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, capitalized. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. It's talking about Jesus. So the entire person of the Godhead or the entire person of the Trinity is in existence in the beginning. And so if we look back down at verse 26 and it says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, it's talking about the Trinity, right? Being present there in the beginning. Now, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? 
What does it mean to be made in his, in his likeness? Well, first of all, it's not a physical thing because God, John chapter four tells us that God is spirit. He doesn't have a physical appearance. The physical appearance of God is Jesus. He's God in the flesh, but God is spirit, right? He also doesn't have a gender. He's not male and female are both made in his image, right? God's not male. God's not female. He is God, right? And so I'm not what God necessarily physically looks like. You're not what God uh, necessarily physically looks like. Being made in the image of God means having uh, morals and ethics and elements of his character that, that we can have. So for example, God is brave so we can be brave. God is love so we can love. God is strong so we can be strong. Now, can we be the same level of things that God has? Like, is my level of love the same as God's? Absolutely not. Is my level of strength the same as God's? Absolutely not. But it means we can adapt to our character elements of his, right? And, and that goes back to random creation. If, if humanity is simply just a random result of billions of years of evolution, where would things like ethics and morals come from? Where, was, where would the notion of goodness even come from? I don't know that it can exist unless you've been, those things I don't believe can exist unless you've been divinely created. And so we see that here. He has created us in his image. He's created us in his likeness. And, um, you notice he has given us, let's see, he, he's created us to rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over livestock and all the wild animals, over the creatures on the ground. He's given us authority, right? He's given us authority to, to rule sort of in his place. Now, does, now, does that mean we are what God looked, uh, or does that mean we are as powerful as God? Absolutely not. But let me put it to you this way. In ancient times, sometimes uh, an emperor, specifically a Roman emperor, would have a statue of himself erected in a province so that everyone who lived there would know who ruled them. You can think of humans kind of as those little statues of God. We are his image bearers, right? And we are supposed to rule the elements of the world, given here, the way that God would, right, with with love and with provision. Now, did humanity end up doing that? No, because humanity fell into sin. Um, but we've been created by God in his image, right? Um, and he's given us authority, right? Uh, we'll come back to being made in the image of God here in just a second, but let's look here at verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This is deeply poetic. You'll, if you'll notice in scripture, it's actually written differently. See how it's written like a poetic stanza? In the Hebrew, this is actually very poetic because each line is meant to read, right, like a poem. And this is beautiful because this is God creating you and I, right? And, and the fact that I, I never try and forget the fact that the fact that I've been created is an act of love and grace, and I think that's incredible. Um, and so this is deeply poetic. This is deeply beautiful. But note here, um, it says male and female, he created them. Those are sexual terms. So right now, just letting you know, here's the awkward part. We've got to talk about sex a little bit. <gasps> Did he just say the S word? In church, here's why I say that, and why I act a little dramatic, because the church has made ta has made the talk of sex taboo. Like most churches, uh, especially here in the Bible Belt, treat the aspect of sex like uh, you know something deeply sinful. It can lead to that, but they treat it like don't say it, don't talk about it, don't think about it, don't do anything with sex. Marry your wife and sit across the kitchen table and look at her, right? Never even get close to her. Like they've made the concept of sex very taboo when the Bible celebrates it. Now, the Bible does say that things like lust and adultery are most assuredly sinful. And in Leviticus chapter 18, it talks about misusing sexuality, right? The Bible condemns the misuse of sexuality. But here, I mean, it's celebrated, right? Right? And we'll see it celebrated here in just a little bit. It, it, it's meant so that the husband and wife uh, be fruitful and, and, and multiply. And if you've ever read the, the Song of Solomon, right, in the Old Testament, it, it, it celebrates, right, the, the, the act of, of sex between a husband and a wife specifically. And so, 
we see sexual terms being used here from the beginning. We see sex from the next verse, be fruitful and increase in number, used from the beginning. The Bible does celebrate it, but it does tell people to be careful because sexual sin is one of the most prevalent, right, throughout all humanity. Now, this is where we should probably talk about uh, uh, things like um, homosexuality and and those who might be transgender or non-binary or what have you. Now, I want to handle this lovingly and, and, and somewhat delicately, but I think we need to talk about it. Let's talk, first of all, homosexuality. Um, the, the, the Bible is clear that that is a sin, right? Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. Um, you know, a man shall not lay with another man as he would his wife. Right? It, it is condemned as sinful. Why is it a sin? Because that is not the way that God intended human sexuality to be. You note right here from verse 27, male and female, he created them. Right? Male and female, and they, as male and female alone, as husband and wife alone, are to be fruitful and increase in number. Not male and male, on, not, not female and female, only male and female or to engage, right, in sexuality within the concept of marriage. That's the way it was originally created, right? And and so when someone is living an alternative lifestyle, right, uh, someone is living a homosexual lifestyle, they are fervently going against that which God has established, right, and are continuing to live a life against that which, which God has ordained, right? And, and so in that way, it is sinful. Um, Let's talk about transgender for, for just a little bit. Uh, this is something that's relatively new, as you are aware. Uh, transgender, non-binary, uh, you know, um, uh, people, uh, that, that's a relatively new concept. And, and I, I looked recently, and now the list of things that people can identify as is, is far longer than I ever uh, assumed it to be. Um, but I will, I will illustrate my thoughts on, on, on being, you know, transgender in the context of, of a little story here. So a couple of years ago, I had a, a friend of mine who was a youth minister reach out to me and he was dealing with a situation in which a, a young person in his youth group was uh, claiming to be transgender. Uh, he didn't elaborate on, on the situation and, and it's none of my business really. I didn't need to know more than that, but, um, he asked both me and another individual, um, would you allow a person who's transgender to be a leader in your youth group, like a teen leader, right? I will give you my answer, and in doing so, give you my thoughts on, on transgender. Here's the thing. Can someone who is transgender or homosexual be a member of your youth group? Absolutely. Of course, they can be a member of your youth group, of course. Can they be a leader in your youth group? No. Uh, that would be my opinion. And, and here's why. Specifically for someone who's transgender. Um, remember from the verses we just read, we have been created in the image of God. It says, so God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So there's only two designated genders. right? There just simply is. If someone wants to be something else, like say someone who is a man wants to be a woman, someone who is a woman wants to be a man. Uh, they are going against that which God has established. And if, let's say, a man wants to be a woman, what he is essentially saying is, I don't like what I was created to be or I don't feel that I, it was correct. And what I, like, I feel that me being a man was a mistake and it implied God did something wrong. And if so, if somebody is living a lifestyle that is transgender um, and they are fervently, openly going against that which God has established, you cannot allow somebody like that to be a leader in your youth group because it's communicating that open rebellion against God is okay. And, and so uh, that would be the issue I, I, I would have with, uh, you know, with, with the transgender concept. It's, it's open rebellion uh, against that which God has established. Now, I want to say this too. It is absolutely egregious for Christians to hate anyone who's homosexual or transgender. Those things are sins, but so is hate. We are not called to hate. You can absolutely love someone 
in that lifestyle without condoning that lifestyle. Finding that balance is hard. But we absolutely have to show love as we've been commanded. Remember John chapter 13, the world will know you're my disciples by how you love. We have to be able to love others while at the same time not condoning that behavior and finding that line is difficult, but it is absolutely unacceptable to hate. All right, we can hate the sin, but we have to love the sinner because we are all sinners. We can't be in the business of condemning people who are just sinning more obviously than we are. And I realize that's a little bit of a soapbox of mine, but but since we are talking about being made in the image of God, since we are talking about sexuality being between male and female, I felt it necessary to talk about. So here we are, you know, God has now created male and female. And, and note that they're created together, right? You know, God create, well, we'll get more into the specific aspects of creation of male and female in the next chapter, but God has created male and female. He, those will be Adam and Eve. And yes, he, um, um, God takes a, a rib from Adam to create Eve. Listen, that does not mean, that does not mean that males are superior to women, right? That drives me insane when, when people say that, right? Well, man was created first and female was created from the man, so females must be secondary. Both, very clearly here, are made in the image of God and must be respected and treated as such. I said what I said. Let's look at verse 28. God blessed them, that is the males and females he's created. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Now, subdue it is actually a military term, but it doesn't mean that we are to go and ravage the earth and, and treat it horribly. It, the word subdue here actually means to manage it the way that God wants us to manage it. Look after it, right? Things of that nature. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit uh, with seed in it. They will be yours for food. Some people think, and I really can't speak to this, but some people think that Adam and Eve were vegetarians, right? Because God only gave them plants and, and seeds to eat. Um, and he also gives, as we as we will see here in a second, he gives the animals seeds and plants to eat. Why would he not give them animals to eat? Because that would involve killing the animal. And that leads me into a conversation here. God is saying everything is good because the concept of sin doesn't exist yet. In the first two chapters of Genesis, the world is perfect. And that's hard for us to grasp because we've never experienced perfection, but, but it's true. At this point, there's no sin, there's no death, there's no killing, there's no malice, there's no disease, there's no hatred, there's no anger, nothing of any kind. The world is perfect here. And so to eat animals would mean to kill an animal and the concept of killing doesn't exist yet. Wrap your mind around that for a second. Um, I'm gonna look here at verse 30. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food and it was so. God saw all that he made, verse 31, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. And so what you have here um, is God the entire scope of what God has created in six days. Now remember, there's only six days of creation because on the seventh day he rests and that's what we'll talk about uh, in two weeks when we get into chapter two. So I hope that this has been eye-opening. Um, I hope that uh, you are excited for our continual trek through the book of Genesis. And if you have any questions, my email is gonna be in the bottom of this video. Uh, if you have prayer requests, make sure to send those to me as well. Uh, but let's pray and then we will be dismissed. Father God, we love you. We are so thankful for your grace that we do not deserve, but you delight to give because you love us. And I pray, Lord, that we understand you have created everything. Everything that exists, including ourselves, uh, you have created because you love us and, and, and we have been intelligently created by you. Uh, I pray for any prayer requests that are on our hearts, Lord, that, that we just lay those at your feet and uh, you know the details of them all. Pray that you continue to help our knowledge grow. Uh, 
I pray that you continue to use me as a vessel, just a vessel to help their knowledge grow. And I pray that uh, as our knowledge grows, our faith grows as well. We love you. It's in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, guys. We will see you next week.